just to kind of kick off, uh, we're going to do some self-introductions of our different panelists. And uh, as a reminder, this is uh, the organized by the Sixth uh, International Conference on the Future of Education. Uh, my name is Mark West. I work in the Division for the Future of Learning and Innovation uh, at UNESCO, the lead United Nations organization for education, science, and culture. Uh, I sit our, our organization's headquarters in Paris, France. So uh, welcome to all our participants. And again, our session will be focused on education for human security, which I think is a really interesting angle. Uh, not often one that we look at here at UNESCO, but excited to talk about that and bring in some different perspectives. Uh, so with that, I'd like to invite our panelists to uh, self-introduce, uh, uh, and maybe we'll start at the top with Frank and, and move on down. So Frank, please. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, afternoon, good evening. Um, I work for UNICEF in education. I uh, lead the... Um, a team that focuses on digital learning and transformation, which is a new team actually established uh, after COVID. Great, thanks a lot, Frank. And then uh, Verna, we'll move to you. Good afternoon, good morning, good day. Um, I know that we're all over the world. My name is Verna Lalbihari. I'm the executive director um, of the EdTech Hub. We're a global research partnership with the goal of empowering um, educators, ministries of education, and leaders around the world by giving them the evidence they need to make good, wise, sound decisions about technology in education. I'm delighted to be part of today's session. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Verna. And then uh, Kitan, if maybe you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi. Uh, pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm Kitan Patel. I'm the chairman of Force for Good and uh, the CEO of Greater Pacific Capital. Force for Good is an endeavor to look at the flows of capital to see if we can actually fund the SDGs and the changes that might be required to those flows and to the systemic changes to capitalism that might allow the world to be leveled up and the SDGs to be funded with, of course, the objective of delivering human security for all. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and finally, our last uh, panel, um, Anne Alib, if you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. My name is Andali, but you can call me Andy. I'm a policy specialist working on human capital in UNICEF Innocenti, the Global Office of Research and Foresight. My team specifically works on uh, sort of future and emerging issues, which are shaping sort of children's rights and children's well-being. Great. Thanks very much. So we only have one hour time, so we're hoping to get uh, sort of three rounds of questions to our uh, different uh, different panelists and then allow for a little bit of time for uh, synthesis. Um, and I wanted to kind of kick today's meeting off with uh, just to sort of draw this link between education and security. It's something that we at UNESCO uh, think about very deeply. Our organization was found in the aftermath of World War II, and it was built with an understanding that education could and should build cultures of peace and nonviolence. Um, but that contention is, is often debated. Is there a straight line between education and peace and security? Uh, it's something that was debated at the time of UNESCO's founding, and I think remains to be debated today. So I think in addition to sort of talking about the importance of education, a conversation around security also needs to veer a little bit into, you know, what types of education and how is it that education, which has expanded massively, uh, at least since uh, UNESCO's creation and the end of World War II, uh, has, has not led to a sort of culture of peace. We continue to be plagued with, uh, with, with violence, uh, with war, and how can we help to sort of bridge this and uh, build greater security uh, in our world. So the first question we're going to, to kick off with, and uh, Frank, I'll sort of follow our order and, and, and point this to you if that's okay. Uh, but what is the nature of the challenge of getting children in the world educated? And then again, how does this link to the issue of human security? Thanks, Frank. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. Um, Maybe just to throw a few numbers out there to start with. Um, 
it, in the world today, there's an estimated 222 million children that are affected by emergencies and by protective crisis, um, whether they're you know, natural disasters, war. Um, so the world, is, a lot of, the world is in a state of insecurity and uh, a large proportion of the children in those contexts aren't going to school. So that is a major issue which we, as UNICEF, try to tackle working with our partners, such as um, UNESCO, UNHCR, and other organizations. Um, besides that, a lot of children are also out of school so, um, in, in general, even children that are not in an emergency context, and that number also increased um, after COVID. So we estimate that there's about 244 million out of school children. So the, the size of the problem is just massive. Um, and then there's also the issue that a lot of children that are going to school, they're not learning the basics. So that's something that we've really been advocating for, you know, with our partners to get you know, the message out there that, um, that, that there's a, a global learning crisis and an estimated two thirds or so of children that even though they're going to school, um, by the age of 10, they're still not able to read a basic sentence. And there's, you know, many reasons for that, for that, um, that, that are underlying uh, that issue. There's the fact that a lot of classrooms are extremely overcrowded. And in some countries, the average class size is, um, you know, more than 70. Um, there's the issue of, you know, insufficient investments in education, uh, you know, um, under acknowledgement of the importance of education, also in addressing the insecurity that you're speaking about earlier. Um, and also the fact that a lot of children are not learning in their mother tongue. So, you know, they go to school and have to learn another language. So these are some of the many issues that we're facing today. And now more than before, technology can actually play a role in helping address um, these challenges. Great, thanks a lot, Frank. And uh, I'm shifting now to Verna. Frank mentioned technology can play a, a role now, never than before. Verna, I mean, we've we've heard this a lot. I thinking back to the time of even uh, Thomas Edison was talking about how schools would be made ir ir uh, redundant because of the invention of the motion picture, and people would learn everything in these amazing uh, moving images. This was at the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, we've heard it again with the rise of sort of mass uh, massive owned TVs, and uh, of course the proliferation of computer technologies, uh, mobile technologies. And now, of course, uh, AI is on everybody's uh, tongues and generative AI. But Verna, if you can maybe sort of draw this link, how can this help ensure education for all? But beyond that, help ensure education that, uh, that, that might lead to, to security. <laughs> A big question there, but uh, your <laughs> insights. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. And, um, you know, I, I perhaps I would lead in by um, saying something that I hold firm in um, my beliefs is that there's no piece of technology that can replace the art of good teaching and learning. So I'd like to start there because um, I really don't believe technology is the panacea um, and a solution to the, the world's problems. We really need to make sure that we understand the unique needs um, of um, our children um, around the world. Foundational literacy and numeracy and making sure that um, students around the world really have a solid opportunity to uh, secure their future by um, getting those foundational skills in place are really critical. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the uh, World Bank statistic and estimate that, that essentially says 70% of 10 year olds in low and middle income countries cannot read or understand a simple text um, by the age of 10. So without being able to read, write, or do basic math, children are really not equipped to navigate a changing world. Um, and that's uh, regardless of, of technology. So those foundational literacy and numeracy skills I see as being really critical and a challenge um, of getting our children um, around the world educated. And that link to human security um, is, is really critical there. Again, just thinking about those links between education and human security, um, clearly they're interconnected and sometimes through a virtuous cycle and sometimes through a vicious cycle. And so um, what I mean by this is that a good educational foundation can help prepare children to handle the challenges of the future. 
Um, and But driving forces around global insecurity, things like um, violent conflict, things like uh, the crisis that we just had with the global pandemic, natural disasters, what's going on in Turkey, Syria, what recently um, happened in um, uh, the floods in Pakistan, all these hinder a child's education um, and making their future less secure. I referenced the um, the floods in Pakistan. Pakistan um, is one of the EdTech Hub's seven focus countries. So definitely one um, that is, you know, hit close to home for the EdTech Hub when the um, June 22 floods hit. Um, again, just to put that in context, that left a third of the country underwater. The floods disrupted education for 3.5 million children and destroyed 26 thousand schools, clearly leading to intense levels of insecurity. So that connection um, is, is really important and the, the foundational skills that we can provide are, are critical. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the links to technology a little later, but just wanted to start off by, you know, really setting the stage that technology is not really the panacea. Okay, over. Thanks a lot for those insights, Rona. Uh, I now wanted to move to, to Kitan, and Kitan, I see, uh, like the name of this idea of technology as a force for good, um, a sort of focus of your organization, but just wanted to maybe kind of bring in some ideas that we often hear in the, in the discourse, and that's this idea that technology, despite all of its promises, educational and otherwise, uh, seems to have a sort of disturbing tendency to increase inequalities in society. Uh, to drive, uh, we hear about a driving polarization, and these we know are sort of source causes of insecurity, of unrest, and indeed of violence. Um, and so I was just wondering, how can we sort of begin to sort of break that cycle uh, through education, uh, as a part of education, by expanding education, of this sort of tendency, I think, that's undeniable at this point of, of this way that technology has increased divides in society and maybe is contributing to some of the polarization uh, that we see. Over to you, Kitan. Thank you. Um, I think it's a very important question, actually, about the, the role of technology in society more broadly, but particularly how it addresses uh, children and education of children. Um, I'd say the first thing is that we, we definitely have a more than one tier society across the world in terms of access to technology. And what we have is a, a subpopulation within the world, um, even within the most developed countries, who have the most sophisticated technologies. And those technologies are propelling them to a much more complex society and a set of skills that suits uh, or enables them to, to take opportunities that uh, are at the forefront of the breakthroughs. Then we have a second tier, which is still has old technologies and they have the last generation's technology still to cope with, and they have not got to the use of AI and other skill, other machine learning technologies to really be advanced. And they've ended up pro just in the job of processing information. And then we have a third tier who have not even had the first range of technologies from 30 years ago. And so there's been no exposure really to technology and technology skills. And if you, if you translate that into the classroom and you start at the bottom of that pyramid of access to technology, then we have society, whole societies that are not really part of what all of us on this, uh, on this Zoom call would consider to be a first-rate uh, society that is delivering first-rate technologies and all the opportunities that come from that. So they've never get, had a chance to participate. And that's our challenge, that we are in at least three different speeds accelerating towards different futures. And we're not helping the bottom of the pyramid in terms of technology access to even catch up because we've not figured out how to deliver technology to remote places. Um, we've not figured out how to get it even to places where there could be internet access at a cost that is sufficiently low that people can access it to get educated. And at the same time, we have um, people at the top of the pyramid who are now being taught AI, who can do all their homework using 
uh, AI too. And you know, as as you asked that question, I, I typed into OpenAI ChatGPT your question, and it gave me five bullet points of the answer, and they're not bad. You know, it says the problem is we have poverty, we have access, we have gender inequality, we have conflict, and we have uh, an imbalance of quality of education provided across the world. Now that that came up in approximately ten seconds. So the top tier of society that can access this technology are ready to move beyond knowledge, almost beyond analysis, and will assume that whether it's Google or an open AI system will deliver the answers. And yet we have a whole tier of society, which is probably as broad as approximately 2 billion people who have either low technology or don't have the skills to really participate. And I think we are storing up a, a problem of such a magnitude that actually it won't be solvable. Uh, there will be no solution without a, a radical shift and transfer of technology from the global north to the global south. Uh, and if we don't do that, we will face massive conflict. Thanks a lot, Keaton. I, I, I think this I have idea... more positive things to say, of course, but yeah, no. the way you asked the question, it seemed like it needed that response before we get to where the solutions might be too. No, thank you. I think the idea of these sort of, of tiers is interesting. Uh, we sometimes use that conceptualization uh, here at UNESCO, and, and I think the point about, you know, this sort of upper tier, if we will sort of you know, constantly having access to the newest technologies, the problem you were trying to solve yesterday, bringing, you know, basic internet connectivity and uh, mobile networks and other things to the unreached and unconnected, we're seeing sort of new new divisions being formed. Um, and how do we sort of get a, a break this uh, cycle? And I think this point you made about uh, how generative AI can lead the sort of haves to be super productive and everybody else a little bit left in the dust, you know, goes back to this point about how can technology help us to close divides uh, rather than widen them with an understanding that um, equal opportunity and equity is, uh, you know, is is foundational to uh, to security. So Andy, uh, kind of over to you, I think uh, Kitan's brought some interesting uh, ideas in, into this, but that sort of question of how, how we might manage this, how technology can be more of a lever uh, uh, you know, than a than a divider and help to in, increase equity in education and beyond. Uh, anyway, your perspectives, uh, Andy, at the the Research Institute for uh, UNICEF. Sure. Um, I think I probably um, highlight a couple of things here. I think first of all, um, I think what we find, at least from the research we have done, so like the, so there's some sort of interesting models of how even in resource constrained environments, uh, schools or teachers or students are adapting technology to their context, right? So of course we know there's a connectivity issue, there is a device issue, there is a skills issue, but how both technology providers and people involved in the learning ecosystem are working with it. So for instance, in our study on personalized learning, we do see models where sort of, they have sort of a rotation model, right? Where you have limited amounts of devices in the school. Then we have another example where, for instance, um, where products can actually work offline. So those are sort of being used in schools in Malawi where you don't have internet connections, but, uh, but, but it's a personalized learning product that can still be used offline or has some offline functionalities. So I think there are interesting ways of approaching the issue. And I think we, that's something we definitely need to, more, to, to look more into. I think in second part comes also around skills, especially teacher skills. So we're increasingly seeing um, a lot of, again, personalized and adaptive learning products incorporate features which are meant to facilitate teachers in working with students. So whether it's through, I mean, a lot of what we see is sort of teacher dashboard that teachers can use to monitor what students are doing, but some products, for instance, go beyond. And they also provide sort of nudges or follow-up interventions or guidance or recommendations to teacher. So in a sense, sort of also build their capacity or to help them understand how they can use the data or work with the data to help the students further. So I think there are sort of some smaller ways in how technology is being designed and implemented that we can look to for some solutions, which can be low cost. Yeah, and I think more research is definitely needed to understand like where they're effective and whether or not. Great. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Andy. Um, we're going to focus a little more in this uh, this uh, second round here on um, kind of technologies, its uh, its promises for education, uh, and you know how it can uh, how it can better uh, deliver uh, to improve access to education, improve the quality of education, and that that will in turn uh, improve uh, peace and security. Uh, and I wanted, I hope that we can sort of focus a lot of our attention on these new generative AIs. Uh, Kitan just, you know, was was using one of these uh, tools just in our in our chat here. I, I know we've all been playing around with it, experimenting with it. Students all over the world uh, using it uh, to complete various homework assignments, um, you know, that had previously uh, required different approaches. Um, what are the promises of these uh, of these sort of frontier tools that have, you know, we've long talked about, have, but have sort of suddenly arrived, um, and also perhaps uh, some of the risks. But uh, Frank, kind of over to you about um, how this can sort of unlock some of these barriers that we keep encountering with education. You mentioned the number of children around the world that are out of school. Mark, I can jump in. Um, yeah, thanks, just, just on a few points, and I want to piggyback off of Andy's um, comments um, around um, um, access around personalized learning and really thinking through again, um, you know, the difference between um, access to uh, platforms and, and, and you know, digital platforms that um, you, that, um, that that lack what we think of as offline um, functionality. So. Um, the EdTech Hub, and I believe Andy's, uh, your team perhaps worked on the uh, Pulse Check on Digital Learning, uh, which is a, a, a resource that um, uh, we collaborated on that really looked at, um, you know, some of the um, mapping of national digital learning platforms. Um, just a few findings that I think are relevant to this conversation around access and equity. Uh, one is that although half the world's population is offline, over 70% of the platforms lack offline functionality, right? So we, we, we realize that there are this insurgence of digital platforms there, but they lack the ability to access them by offline uh, modalities. And that is further uh, exacerbated in the, our focus countries, which are low and middle income countries, where 18% of national digital learning platforms in low-income countries offer that online, uh, sorry, that offline um, functionality. So for technology to really mitigate inequalities, we have to really focus on and attend carefully to, again, the potential to exacerbate them. And data points like this speak to that and, and really are critical to um, charting that path forward that does does not perpetuate um, inequality. So um, I, I just think when it comes to digital personalized learning and the ability of platforms to be able to do that, um, the lack of offline access could be a, a huge um, uh, inequality um, lens. So just wanted to add that as a piggyback. Yeah, th thanks Thanks a lot, Verna. Um, could I add something to that? Yeah, please, Kitan, please. So it was something we're working together with uh, Frank uh, at UNICEF and his team. Um, they have a solution which they think is almost a closed end server of some sort of hub to serve a community that is remote. And it's fantastic. I mean, like, you know, until we figure out how to connect everybody, um, we, we can't leave people out. And there's almost a tendency to say, well, it's uneconomic to access that population set because they're too remote, it's too poor, there are no there are no satellites we can get to just to do the last mile. But UNICEF have been working on a solution that is um, that is a hub, a closed end hub, if you like. It's offline, but it provides functionality. And I think it's powerful to do that and imperative. And maybe something, Andy, you can speak about too. Uh, when you come back to me, I'd love to describe a stack of technologies, which I think would, would provide a, a blueprint or a route to to step by step taking people and putting them all on the same tracks. And so, um, but I'll come back to that. Great. Thanks, Kitan. Uh, Andy, some of your, uh, your, your, pers your perspectives here and uh, ways you mentioned in your, your first intervention, some of the ways technology can you know, be used to kind of close gaps in areas with limited connectivity. Verna spoke about that, Kitan as well. But some of your insights on on how this uh, these bridges can be uh, can be closed, given the sort of 
inequalities that exist with us right now. Over to you. Sure. Um, I think a lot of times, I think we need sort of an ecosystem level solutions or the ecosystem level partners, depending on the type of issue, right? Like we've seen cases where, you know, where maybe lack of internet access is the issue, right? So you have zero rating services being provided by telcos who have partnered with governments or with development partners, right? So that's one way of in terms of um, reducing sort of affordability issues, right? Um, Again, in terms of, I really like what Ketan said about sort of these close end sort of local service kind of solutions, because we've seen sort of these kinds of things also work with uh, products that you can buy online as well, right? Where schools can set up these sort of local networks within the school and children sort of work off on devices in a computer lab or in a room that sort of, uh, that, that's set up in a particular way. Um, I think we also, I mean, this is just based on my personal experience in Sierra Leone a long time back with the World Bank where, you know, when internet access is being provided, you know, when like I think fiber um, optic lines are being laid down under the World Bank project. So one of the conversations we had was that when you're providing that kind of uh, infrastructure, can we also connect some schools and colleges? So I think these are some of the partnerships and solutions we need to also be looking at besides you know, like, you know, while we wait for universal connectivity or universal electricity access. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think in terms of frontier technologies on generative um, technologies, I think the field is actually much vast, right? As I, I, I was mentioning a work on personalized learning and we see sort of generative AI being used to generate content. So there are like one or two products out there that generate practice assessments and questions on the fly, right? So it's not like they've hired people and there's a static data bank of items that's there. So it's generative AI that's being sort of used to come up with practice questions based on sort of student performance and the gaps in, and, and, and sort of and the gaps in the knowledge that's being identified. So I think that's an interesting use of sort of generative AI. We also see some increasing sort of work around sort of conversational Oh, you know, using NLP and stuff on conversational AI, right? So I think there is a famous sort of a Google product where, you know, when children read, it automatically identifies sort of errors in pronunciation um, and sort of come back with sort of remedial suggestions, right? So I think there are sort of potential in how AI and generative AI can be used beyond just chat GPT, GPT or, yeah. Or what, yeah, or what everybody is concerned with right now. Yeah, thanks for those ideas, Andy. And I'm, I'm struck that as, as you're speaking, I mean, I think also, uh, you know, recognition that a lot of these problems we're touching on are outside of the scope of the education sector. And by the sector, I mean, you know, ministries of education and other things. But there are certainly some things under our control. And I know that together with uh, UNICEF, uh, UNESCO um, and UNICEF jointly have an initiative to improve the quality of public digital learning content in recognition that many people do have connectivity, they do have digital skills, but they don't have clear places to go to improve their learning, uh, to enrich you know, their education. And so hoping that um, governments will get more serious about uh, providing you know, world-class content um, online. I see Frank is back, but maybe Frank, if you'd like to build on that and hopefully. So just on that, I mean, and also just to get back to your, the, the, the thing, what you mentioned in the beginning, Mark, you know, we've been, we've been hearing about the promise of technology for decades. And, um, you know, just talking about my own personal experience, I started my career in edtech was almost 20 years ago, remote rural villages of India. Um, and technology was showing great promise, but all I saw was that it was actually widening inequalities and perpetuating them. And I abandoned a career in edtech for that reason and came back to it a few years ago um, because I think now the situation has really changed. And you mentioned about the fact that, you know, e even if children have access to technology, often they, you know, there's many other factors which, which prevent them from benefiting from those opportunities. And we saw that during COVID. We did a lot of research as UNICEF and also with partners uh, during COVID on, on the reach and effectiveness of the, of the remote learning. And we found that... Um, um, a lot of children, probably at least half of children that actually had devices, smartphones, they had connectivity in their home, and they were still not learning. And why is that? Um, and we're seeing also from previous experiences like the one laptop per child. Um, I, I was just also in Kenya where 
where the, the government invested $270 million on, on buying tablets for every primary school. And what we know is that, you know, that, that having that infrastructure is, 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 is necessary, but it's not nowhere near enough. So that's why with UNESCO, UNICEF launched um, in September last year during the Transforming Education Summit, an, a new global initiative, Gateways to Public Digital Learning. And the idea is that uh, a, a digital learning should become a, a public good, ideally. And we saw that during COVID that kids that were connected, had devices, they still didn't have anywhere to go. There was no space for them, at least not in the mother tongue. Um, not that, uh, they didn't have their own national platform that where they could access resources. Um, so I think that's something that we really need to build upon, build upon all the progress that was made during COVID. A lot of governments actually started building those platforms during COVID. Um, but um, as uh, Werner was also speaking about in the pulse check report we did, we found out that a lot of those platforms are now kind of abandoned. Um, they're no longer being updated. They've been discontinued. Actually, one third of them are in that state. Uh, so we need to kind of bring that back to momentum. Um, and also looking at the quality of this platform and the inclusivity. So for example, you can have a national platform, but if you cannot access the platform through a, a smartphone, it probably means that, you know, in, in some countries, the vast majority cannot access it because if they have a device, you know, it'll be, a, um, if they ha it won't be a tablet or a computer, it will be a smartphone, or it needs to be accessible for children with disabilities. Um, it needs to continue to run when, when you're offline, you should be able to download the content, you know, and that links to what Katan was saying about um, also this innovation that we have in schools, that you can continue to serve content and even to track learner, learner progress while offline. So we have these innovations, they exist right now. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the very simplest is really just a mobile app that continues to run. And if you go onto your own smartphone, you probably notice that if you have apps that continue to run when, when you're in the in the subway or something and you're disconnected or wherever. Uh, actually, in my office in New York is another place where there's no, <laughs> no connectivity for some reason. Some apps continue to run. Some apps just break down. So you're basically it's learning apps, especially in countries that we work in, they just need to continue to run. You need to be able to just download stuff um, or transfer things and, and then continue to use it. But that's, and then there's the quality side, which is that often, you know, some of those platforms are like seven PDFs, a couple of textbooks, but you also have some very sophisticated um, um, platforms. But the sad state of affairs is that um, the, the great innovations and the things that Andy was talking about as well with personalized adaptive learning, those solutions, tend to be in the private sector digital learning solutions. And there's this gap between what the public sector is offering and the, you know, those private sector solutions that are leveraging personalized adaptive learning that adapt to your level, that have this great dashboard for teachers so they can track progress for parents, yeah. um, leveraging AI and, and you know. So yeah. we kind of narrow that gap and that's also part of our work with the Gateways Initiative. Yeah, thanks, Frank, and couldn't agree more in our sort of deep analysis of experiences during COVID-19. I mean, what what came through this, this global experience was that when education crosses this line into the digital, it becomes almost fully privatized, you know, and historic conceptions of education are that it's a common and a public good. Uh, but once that line is crossed into digital spaces, uh, that often seems to sort of dissipate, if not completely disappear. And that need not be the case. Um, there have been uh, many public efforts to sort of harness uh, technologies, including the radio and television, public uh, radio, public television, to sort of use these for the public good. And we heard, as you mentioned, at the Transforming Education Summit, we heard some ministers of education talk about how they were making major investments in public digital learning platforms, and that by thinking about it as a public good, it was enabling innovation that maybe wouldn't even be possible in the private sector. There wasn't a need for username and passwords. There wasn't a need for sort of sticky content. There wasn't a need to keep people on pages for long periods of time. There wasn't a need to place advertisements and other things. And so that I think that could establish some sort of new possibilities for what a digital learning experience uh, might look like and break some of the paradigms uh, that we have seen that kind of came to prominence during COVID-19 and, you know, are with us very much to this day. Kitan, I wanted to come back to you. You had mentioned a sort of stack of technologies, and if you can kind of carry forward this uh, this conversation, too, around um, public and private, and know that you're working in one of these sort of, you know, helping to sort of push innovation through the private sector. But over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, 
if, if I if I put my hat on as an investor, so I'm, I'm CEO of Greater Pacific Capital, it's an investment firm. Uh, one of our most important investment themes is, is education uh, from a technology perspective. So it's ed tech. And we see an enormous amount of innovation in the private sector seeking to take almost every aspect of technology um, and education and find solutions that they can implement for large populations. So you know, we'll find a micro solution that is just designed to uh, help very young children um, get the attention they don't get from their family environment. And so there'll be something robotic that will uh, have very big eyes and look at the child and talk to the child and give some of the nurturing almost as a substitute parent. And now that sounds really sad, but without it, the child has almost no nurturing signals coming from anybody. And so we've seen that to the other extreme where we see children who have uh, come to the kind of almost pre-adult getting trained so they can be skilled to do a job in a technology environment and so on uh, mass and so we see that too then we see immersive technologies where you get an opportunity to train a child um, or provide an education to a child in a poor area where they with a first class education and something that can be delivered to do that um, we also see people coming along taking a whole curriculum and converting it all so it's all online and it can be self-served alongside uh, options like YouTube and others so that you can augment the education. Now, a lot of this is very private sector driven. It's enormously profitable. Ed tech is one of the, the highest valued areas that we see that people are, uh, are now addressing alongside you know, healthcare and financial inclusion and so on. So if, if, there, if I speak of a stack, I would say the bottom of that stack, that the must haves is an internet connection. Ideally, a fully online, fully functioning internet connection that opens up the, the possibilities for a child to connect to knowledge across the whole world and, and to, to get that served in every form of media. And so that's going to be one. But if you can't have that, the closed end hub, which UNICEF are working on and have solutions for, which for a few billion dollars connects, starts to connect the most remote places in the world, is a fantastic solution. And on top of that, you have all these ed tech solutions in the private sector that you can add. And they're, they're, in, they're across the world. We see enormously successful businesses of that type in, in the developing world too. And the third layer I think is that we figure out how to deliver immersive education using VR and other technologies to, to any child across the world, delivering a curriculum so that if you're in a poor country, um, it, it, our poor city in India or anywhere else in the world, you should be able to access a first world education online. And it should be VR and you should feel immersed into that. One of the biggest challenges has been how do you reduce the, the cost of uh, a visor that allows you to access that? And so we ran a little experiment. We, we issued almost like an invitation to tender and asked people to figure out a solution for under $2. And what we found was for under $2, you can make a headset that you can put on uh, that is good enough for you to have an immersive experience. That's under $2. So, of course, the upper end will cost, you know, 1000 or more. But for $2, you can actually start to deliver this. So that's part of the stack. And then with AI added to that stack and the regenerative technologies that we're seeing, uh, I think the biggest challenge is if, if it's not about knowledge, and that is no longer a competitive advantage for, for human beings, then what is, the, what is the place that we're meant to take the next generation of children to? Is it, is it creativity? Is it forming solutions? What is it? Because in some part of the world, um, in the most advanced countries, we recognize that it isn't about what you know, and it hasn't been for a long time. And it is about how you use that knowledge to form the basic solution, because that can be served up to you now. So the world is already pushing that boundary. Uh, and it's pushing that boundary at the same time as some countries see education as another way of propaganda and of keeping people in their box and making sure society doesn't change and doesn't improve. And so this is our challenge is this technology stack is deliverable. Um, how fast can we get people through that stack? And I'm hopeful that actually with the right investments, because this is such a profitable area, 
somewhere in the next five years, we should have solved most of this problem because the capital is available and this is very attractive to do. Hmm. Thanks, Gitan. I have some interesting uh, perspectives and ideas. Um, as as you were speaking, I'm I'm a little struck at how this sort of promise of change right around the corner is. You know, we're 20 years into this digital it's revolution. There. <laughs> uh, you know, where where is it? Other sectors have been upended and and changed, and you know, in profound ways. I mean, we we yes. can't say otherwise at this point. Whether you're looking at uh, media or even commerce or other things have have changed in profound mm -hmm. ways education a, a bit less so some people will say that's you know education is this sort of digital la laggard education is sort of frozen but i think other ways to look at that is um you know that uh, you know i think COVID opened our eyes to you know this mm. question of what is education for many people that's about you know building skills building competencies i think as we all think is important building foundational uh, literacy and numeracy i mean certainly that's a part of education but also you know, with the closure of schools, I think people saw them a bit anew that schools do a lot more than just academic curricular learning. It's about learning how to get along in a in a community outside of your family to, you know, deal with people who are unlike uh, un unlike those in your immediate sort of social circle or familial circle. Um, it's about learning how to solve conflicts without resorting to violence. I mean, the focus of our panel here is security that we saw a lot of sort of you know, we ascribe a lot of purposes to education. A lot of the times that debate is sort of narrowed to academic curricular learning. And I think COVID has kind of reminded people that education serves a lot of purposes sort of beyond that. And maybe there are limits to some of that, you know, what what uh, what technology is capable of and, you know, what is required to sort of happen in, in these more traditional sort of uh, school environments. So and Mark, I think you, yeah, I think you said well. I think you said it really well because if technology is, if it's effective, it will augment the, the the social nature of a school, but it will not replace it. Otherwise, we'll find very maladjusted uh, generations of children coming through the system. Yes, but yet, well, while we all say that rhetorically, we do see many models that do seem to suggest some type of replacement. I mean, you know, and we and we hear rhetorically that there's you know, this youth boom in, in you know, in low income countries that's, that's coming up the pipeline. And there's, you know, there's sort of nothing to be done but turn to technology. So anyway, this idea that an investment in technology is also, of course, an investment, you know, a lack of investment in, in something uh, in something else. Um, but I wanted to move into our sort of uh, third phase, if we will, uh, kind of get in a final round, very interesting discussion, but looking to kind of the way forward. and you know, sort of opening our imaginations to different possibilities. And I wanted to preface this something with uh, just a thought I was having earlier today through reading, but I was reading about, again, on the subject of the newer generative AIs, about the investments that were being made, and they use this word, in the education and training of technologies. Billions of dollars being poured into educating and training generative AI technologies. I, and that, that really struck a kind of chord with me that we've hit this moment where, you know, our communities, our governments, our organizations are going to have to make determinations about where to steer money. Are we investing money in educating and training these sort of technologies that, that point to the future? Or are we investing money and resources in the training of sort of people and building this sort of human capacity. Um, anyway, it was just something that really uh, sort of struck me to, to you know, to, to see this and, and, and sort of uh, see it, you know, that kind of level of separation. I don't mean to suggest it's, a, it's an either or choice or something, but anyway, wanted to bring this into the discussion. But Frank, over to you, recommendations, the way forward, sort of final thoughts before we close our, our session here. Um, thanks, Mark. And, um, you know, maybe just to go back to, to Verna's uh, point from the beginning, you, you know, that, um, you know, technology shouldn't really replace, we don't see it as a replacement for traditional, you know, face-to-face -face learning. It should really complement. But there are situations, you know, with climate change and emergencies uh, increasing in frequency, it, it, you know, the, as mentioned also in the beginning, you know, many millions of children are in those emergency contexts. And there, you know, they often don't have access to this, you know, 
like a brick building and the regular traditional schooling. So in those situations, you do need, you know, technology, you know, to, you know, digital learning plays a much bigger role in those situations. You could have textbooks, but it really plays a key role to keep, get, you know, have the teacher staying in touch with the students and everything. Something that didn't happen sufficiently during COVID, for example, the technology wasn't sufficiently leveraged um, for that. Um, so maybe just, you know, just to put that on the table. Um, and I think we also, we also talk a lot about, you know, we've been seeing the promise of technology for decades, but there are some kind of things which have emerged in recent years that are just completely groundbreaking and we still, it's hard to predict what will happen and what, 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 will, what, what will take us. You know, the adaptive personalized learning solutions that Andy spoke about it, um, in her research. Um, the Etec Hub, I mean, Verna's, Verna's um, organization has done a lot of research also on the evidence and what's effective. But maybe just to add one more thing uh, before we close, which is, you know, there's also the, the innovations in VR uh, and, and mixed reality. And uh, VR has always been something very kind of expensive and, you know, um, you know, thousands of dollars for headsets. But now you can get those, you know, you have those cheap little VR things for, you know, I don't know, $30, $40 and something more sophistic quite sophisticated for maybe $200, $300. And I think we need to look at how technology can actually make education more cost effective as well, because that's what, what we need to think about in situations where you have to decide between technology or an alternative, you know, and if you invest in technology, you might divert investment from other things, right? So that's a really important question. And just to give one example, I think when it comes to technical and vocational training, things like woodwork, engineering, um, to, you know, repairing cars, metal work, those kinds of career paths, they require a lot of equipment and it can be quite expensive, right? But I think this kind of thing could be replaced with a, with uh, to a large extent by a, by a headset. So it's an, an example of where $200 headset could perhaps, perhaps replace thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of equipment and also bring that learning experience into a very remote area where you could never build that kind of facility in the first place um, without, without a massive investment. So I think that there are lots of examples like that. Also what Katan was speaking about in terms of having this hub device. Um, you don't need a super high bandwidth internet necessarily if you have a kind of device that can you know, stream like the high bandwidth content um, and have maybe the low bandwidth content coming through that live internet connection. So there are those solutions that can make technology and, and its impact on education very cost effective in ways that were not possible even, you know, uh, five or 10 years ago. So I think that's really where that we will see a lot of groundbreaking work over the next few years. Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, Verna, over to you, perspectives from the, the EdTech Hub and, and, and your work on, uh, on, on education data and data about the effectiveness of educational technologies. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I want to go to um, something you signaled earlier uh, before, and, and I think we've we've touched a lot on inequalities, on digital infrastructure, content, connectivity, etc. I would definitely want to underscore where you were going, Mark, initially around human capacity and human infrastructure and investing in our teachers. So those billions of dollars, I would like to see some part of it go to really building teacher capacity, supporting our educators, doing it from an ecosystem perspective, like Andy had referenced, where we really have to go back to our teacher prep programs. How are our teacher prep programs um, building the capacities or the competencies of educators for a digital age context, right? So really looking holistically at that. Um, the, the other piece that I would add that I think is really important is, is looking again at um, what we think of as ed tech strategies, right? How do ministries of education build uh, effective digital learning strategies into their um, master plans or their education sector plans in ways that are meaningful. So they're not a sidebar, but in, integrated holistically um, into um, education planning with large. The, um, um, the EdTech Hub has launched a research portfolio of about 13 or 14 research studies. So definitely be on the lookout for um, the, the data that's going to start emerging. Um, and we're looking at um, uh, th three big um, areas. So one is, um, is the use of technology um, cost effective? Can it be scaled? And is it truly gonna move the needle on student learning? In, and specifically in, in low and middle income uh, contexts, right? So um, definitely stay tuned for that. 
But I do want to leave you with um, what, what the EdTech Hub calls our challenge to the sector, right? So a, a few uh, uh, framing questions that we should all be uh, obsessed with answering um, and asking and seeking answers to as we go um, down this path of um, digital learning and technology. So I'll just run through the questions really fast. Will this use of technology lead to sustained impact on learning outcomes? Will this use of technology work for the most marginalized children and enhance equity? Will this use of technology be feasible to scale in a cost-effective manner that is affordable for the context? Will this use of technology be effective in the specific implementation context? Again, and will this use of technology align with government priorities and lead to strengthening national education systems? So um, again, these are just um, food for thought, but really important to, um, to round out our, our conversation today. So thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Verna, and thanks for leaving us with those uh, those rich set of questions. I think a, a useful set of good questions to apply to any kind of, you know, perspective technology uh, implementation. Um, Kitan, final thoughts as we sort of wrap this uh, webinar, and then uh, Andy will bring it over to you for 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 last words. But but Kitan, please. Um, uh, my final thoughts, I think, would would build off what um, you've already heard in some ways. Um, we can't build enough schools, train enough teachers to serve the, the population today fast enough to meet the, the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as we add approximately 2 billion more people between now and 2050, that challenge just becomes even more incredible. And so without technology flowing to every part of the world, it's not possible. So agenda one has to be an internet connection, whether it's, uh, it should be a live full, fully fledged internet connection, but if not a hub that simulates that for, for small populations. And that has to be the basis. Our technology as a force for good work demonstrates uh, or calculates that actually you would close 20%, approximately the SDG gap, just by achieving that, just, just through the connection and the flow of information that goes through that. And then another 20% would be closed of the full SDG gap if technology transfer happened of existing technologies across countries and across boundaries. And so this is the hope actually, that we, we have an imperative to do that. And given this is education we're speaking about, it's, it's a very profitable thing to do. And so large amounts of capital should be very incentivized to do that. So I, I really hope that policymakers will focus on the technology industry just as aggressively as they focus on the finance industry over the last decade. The next frontier is to, to mobilize the tech and communications industry. Thanks, Kitan. And uh, Andy, final thoughts uh, from you? Sure. I think um, everybody has said a lot of what I want to say. I think just uh, emphasizing a couple of points. I think what both Frank and Varna said, uh, if you want digital technologies to be effective for learning and to improve learning outcomes. It's more than just about connectivity, devices, platforms, and content, right? It's about also how do you capacitate teachers so they can play sort of an important role in how those things are being utilized. So I think sort of looking at those sort of human factors that Varna was talking about is absolutely, is absolutely critical. Um, I think the second is that, um, uh, I think maybe we need to, I mean, one thing that we sort of find in a research is sort of issues around scaling and financing. And it's not just financing sort of at like the project level or financing it in like X number of schools. It's even things like where do VCs or investors put their money? I mean, like, you know, is there a rate role for market shaping and market influencing there for for organizations like NSF, UNESCO, or the EdTech Hub, right? I mean, because frankly, what we see, like sometimes it's not always about effectiveness, right? Like what attracts the most amount of funding or what gets a lot of attention may not necessarily be about who it impacts or how large the impact is. A lot of time, we don't even know how effective these solutions are. So I think we need to sort of come up with sort of also improve our understanding and standards around like how we evaluate these technologies, how maybe we should think about funding these technologies or, or incentivize funding for marginalized groups or for technologies that can benefit maybe marginalized groups the most because that's not where the money necessarily grows. I think again the role of edtech policy in that like a, a lot of times I feel edtech policies are sort of operating in a very 
you know, they're assuming like everything is publicly provided, publicly funded, publicly delivered. But that's not the reality of the edtech marketplace, right? So I think how your edtech policies think about regulating, enabling, or facilitating that marketplace, I think that's something that needs a lot of thinking about. I mean, I think there's some interesting things that I think some countries are doing. Like I was really interested in sort of the India NEDR example, where they want to build sort of that digital architecture or backbone, because you can't expect a school to buy like 20 products, right? But if you have like that kind of like, yeah, architecture and backbone that, yeah, that the governments can really fund and help develop, I think that could be useful. So Great. that's it for now, thanks. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, I just wanted to, again, we're at the end of our time, but a uh, big thank you to our uh, to our four panelists. Uh, at least for me personally, that was a very, uh, very interesting exchange. I appreciated this uh, kind of lens of, of human security. I think we can all sort of agree that education needs to advance uh, human capacities. And as Verna reminded us, an important way to advance human capacities is, of course, with um, you know, teaching and learning that involves uh, involves other human beings, and the technology can be a very powerful tool to uh, to enrich uh, to enrich this experience and to help build these uh, human capacities uh, that are that are so important. Um, so, with that, uh, we leave you. Thanks very much.